Good morning. Now you can do better than that. Good morning. That's it. That's it. That's it. Now, I see some of the kids are back there. Now, all the kids should be up front here, okay? So you can, you can really, uh, uh, well, all of you, <laughs> you're okay. I mean, the, any of them that are back in the audience, if you want to come up here, you know, you're welcome to. Um, how many of you were here the last one that we did a week or so ago for President Washington? Well, that's good. A lot of, a lot of repeats. That's great. Um, thank you again for bringing your parents. Uh, parents, thank you for coming. We hope this is a good experience for you and, and your kids. We're going to do this all summer long. We have four more, and we have a postcard uh, that's online, and it's in our gift shop. So if you want to know who's coming and when, you can pick this up, and we hope you'll come to every one of them. And yes, there's free punch and cookies at every one of them. Now, what room are you kids sitting in? What's the name of this room? That's the East Room. Thank you. Now, this room is a replica of the real thing at the White House in Washington, D.C. In the White House, that's where the President, President Obama, and his two daughters, and his wife, uh, and his mother-in-law all live. And it's the, this East Room is the biggest room in the White House. It's where seven presidents have laid in state, including Abraham Lincoln. The first first lady to live in the White House, Abigail Adams, hung her laundry up. She put big clotheslines and hung it up. Abraham Lincoln's kids, or son, Ted, uh, brought his goats in here when the weather was bad outside. And lots of presidents' kids have played in here. They roller skated. They ruined the floors. None of you have roller skates, do you? Nobody? No, I mean on. Oh, you have them at home. Okay. Can't bring them here. But anyway, it's a famous room. Uh, President Nixon's daughter, Tricia, was married in the Rose Garden, which we have a duplicate of outside, and then had a reception in the East Room at the White House. And President and Mrs. Nixon also started Sunday worship services in the East Room. Now, you're here today to hear the 26th President of the United States, Teddy Roosevelt. Um, he was involved in the East Room, too, because he led the Rough Riders, this great military group, during the Spanish-American War, and he had a reunion of them here. And also, one time when he had a dinner for the senators and the cabinet, members of Congress, as entertainment, he didn't bring in outside piano play or anything. He brought in some Chinese wrestlers, and he wrestled them himself. He was that kind of a guy. He was a great president, and I'm excited and proud that he's here today to talk to you. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to bring him out. He's going to talk to you for a few minutes, and then he'll answer questions. So kids, get some questions ready, and then after he speaks, I'm going to bring this microphone around, and if you have a question, you raise your hand, and then when I come over to you, you stand up, and you state your name in the microphone and ask the question, okay? Then after the questions and answers, he's going to stand up here, and you can line up and meet him, and your parents, if they have, photo if they have cameras, they can take your photograph with the president. Then we're going to go in the back and do coloring. There's pictures of his birthplace and of him, his family, and you can color those and take them home and scotch tape them to your living room walls uh, <laughs> or nail them, put them up in your bedrooms and that sort of thing. Put them on the refrigerator. And we have punch and cookies. So boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, please stand and welcome the 26th President of the United States, Teddy Roosevelt. be 
be seated, please. I am delighted to be here today. Bully, bully. You know, there is an old African adage that says, to speak softly and carry a big stick and you will go far. But while you keep your eyes to the stars, you should keep your feet to the ground. I was born in New York City on the 27th of October, 1858. My parents were Theodore Roosevelt Sr. and Martha Bullock. But my earliest memories of childhood were of being sick and weak and suffering from the ill effects of asthma, having trouble breathing. And I remember my earliest memories of my father carrying me upstairs. And I recall after a trip to New England when I was about 13, I had met boys my age, and I had trouble keeping up with them and actually got into a fight with them. And I couldn't hold my own, and I told my father about this. And I have to tell you about my father. He was the finest man I ever knew. He said to me, Theodore, while you build up your mind, you must also build up your body. He also later told me, when I went to college, to remember my, my morals, my health, and then my studies. But you know what he did? He built me a gymnasium, and there I exercised to overcome the ill effects of asthma. You want to have, why don't you, won't you fo young folks stand up? Let's do some exercises right now. Very good. Now, follow me. Put your hands out like this. Like this. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Very good. Now, out again. Let's squat. One, up, and two, and up, and three, and up, and four, and up, and five, and up, and six, and up. Very good. Now let's do some push-ups. All right, down on the ground, and one, and up, and two, and up, and three, and up, and four, and up, and five, and up. Very good. Very good. Bully. Delighted. You see, that is the, you see, by exercising, I overcame the ill effects of asthma. And that has led me to an important belief that I believed in all my life. The idea of the strenuous life, that one must be willing to go in there, take risks, even if one is knocked down, but to come up again and to continue fighting for what you strongly believe in and to achieve those goals as I have. <sighs> yes. Well, as I said, I went to Harvard University, and when I was there, I happened to write a, one of the first of many books I was to write throughout my life. This one was a naval war, a history of the naval war of 1812. And when I was there, I met a lovely young woman by the name of Alice Hathaway Lee, and we were married in 1880. The following year, at the age of 23, I was elected the youngest member of the New York State Assembly. And then one day in February of 1884, I was on the floor of the state legislature in Albany, and I had received a telegram. A daughter, Alice, had been born to me in New York. So I rushed back on the train back to New York City. But when I arrived at our home in Manhattan, my younger brother, Elliot, greeted me, and he said, there is a curse upon this house. You see, my mother had died that day, and my wife died later that night. I felt as if the light had gone out of my life. But I knew I had to overcome that grief. And you know what I did? I lived out one of my childhood fantasies. Has anyone here ever wanted to be a cowboy and be a rancher and live out in the West? Well, that's what I did. I went out to become a cattleman. And does someone, does anyone want to help me on my ranch? Do I have anyone who wants to volunteer and help me? Yes, would you like to help me? Yes, I need, do we have anyone else who would like to help me? Yes, right over there, please, come on. I need someone to help me out, because we've got to, come on. Let's get on our horses. Very good. I went out there, went out west. Well, let's, come on, ride. Let's, let's ride our horses. Come on, let's go, let's go. Hasty yonder there, fellows, oh yes my eastern dude way sometimes came out. Why, I was even deputized as a deputy sheriff, and once when some rustlers stole my boat, I went after them, I pursued them, 
and I captured them and brought them to justice. Yes, and we'll let the local sheriff take care of them. Thank you. Thank you. Well, after living two years in the West, I returned East, and in late 1886, I met up with an old childhood friend, Edith Corot, and I married her. And we, of course, have been married since then. And she bore me another five children, Theodore Jr., Kermit, Ethel, Quinton, and Archie. And we moved into a house out in Oyster Bay, which I called Sagmore Hill. I re-entered public life. I served on the U.S. Civil Service Commission. I was the president of the Board of New York City Police Commissioners. And then in 1897, President William McKinley appointed me Assistant Secretary of the Navy. But there were problems with Spain. You see, Cuba had been under Spanish control, and the people of Cuba rose up against their Spanish masters, just as we had risen up earlier against the British. And many of us were concerned in the United States. We sympathized with the Cubans and felt they should overthrow the Spanish rulers. Well, in February of 1898, the battleship Maine exploded in Havana Harbor. Many people were convinced that the Spaniards were behind it. And many people were urging that we, ha that we need to go to war. President McKinley, though, was rather reluctant. Uh, personally, I thought he had the backbone of a chocolate eclair. But when war was declared, my place was not at a desk. No, you know where my place was? It was to be out in the field. So I resigned as Assistant Secretary of the Navy, and I joined the U.S. Army and organized the first volunteer United States Cavalry known as the Rough Riders. And I need some volunteers to follow me down to Cuba. Do we have any? Oh, yes, sir, right over here, right over here. Very good. How about right over there? Very good. Do we have any more volunteers to, for Cuba? How about you, sir? Very good. One over here. And how about right over here? Do we have any more volunteers? I'll take maybe one. Let's see, someone else who hasn't done anything. How about right there and right over here? Very good. All right, very good. All right, soldiers, let's stand in a line. Facing that way. No, no, this way. Oh, I can see they're going to need some good training. All right, soldiers, attention. Right face. Follow me. <laughs> over hill, over dale, we will hit the dusty trail as the caissons go rolling along. For it's high, high, he in the field artillery. Count out your numbers loud and strong. One, two, for wherever you go, you will always know that the caissons go rolling along. Keep them rolling as the caissons go rolling along. Now, we still had to get to Cuba, and we finally arrived there in J July of 1898. And... We were ready to attack the Spanish fort at Kettle Hill. Are you ready to follow me up Kettle Hill to attack the Spanish fort at San Juan Hill? Follow me, charge! Very good, we captured, we captured the Spanish fort at Kettle Hill and San Juan Hill. And as a result, it made me a national hero. I returned to New York, a national hero, and I was asked, and before, and I was asked by many people to run for public office. But first, I think we all should give a salute to our Rough Riders right here. Thank you all very much. Very good, very good. Well, I returned to New York, and I was asked to run for public office. I was elected governor of New York in 1898. And as governor, I sought to carry out what I believe is that government should be used to help the people and to serve the interests of the public and do what is right for the, pu for the public, and not necessarily for just a few privileged people. However, some of the Republican leaders in New York State didn't like the way that I was doing things, and they wanted to get rid of me. So you know what they did in 1900? They had me nominated for vice president of the United States to run with President McKinley for his re-election. And when Mark Hanna, President McKinley's campaign manager, found out that I was nominated for vice president, you know what he said? 
Don't you realize there's one life between that madman and the White House? Well, President McKinley and I were elected in November 1900, and we were sworn in in March of 1901. But in September of 1901, I was on a camping trip with my family up in the Adirondack Mountains in New York, and then I'd received a message that why, President McKinley had been shot in Buffalo, New York, by an anarchist. Well, I rushed there. It looked like the President might recover, so I decided to return to the Adirondacks with my family to go on my hiking trip. And then I was up at Mount Marcy, the highest point in New York State, that day in September of 1901, when I received another message. The President's condition had worsened. I knew I had to rush back to Buffalo immediately. And I quickly, we went, we quickly, I got on, remember getting on that court horse and the cart and I was telling the driver to go faster, to go faster, to go faster. We must get to Buffalo. We have to get there as soon as we can. And then we boarded the train to Buffalo. And then when I arrived there, I found out that President McKinley had died. And at the age of 42, I was sworn in as the youngest and 26th President of the United States. It's a terrible way to come into the presidency this way, but I have to give it the best of my ability, and I did. You see, I believe the presidency should be the great bully pulpit to fight the fundamental fight for democracy. I believe in a square deal for the American people, that there should be equally good service to everyone, regardless of your class or your station in life. Why, when coal miners went on strike, People needed coal to fuel their homes, to stay warm. So you know what I did? I did not intervene on the side of the coal miners or of the mine owners. I intervened on the side of the American people, brought both sides to arbitration to show that the government was there to work for the people. Yes, and one day I read a book called The Jungle, written by Upton Sinclair. And it revealed all these terrible conditions, the way sausages were made. So I urge the Congress to pass the Pure Food and Drug Act. It will not be the public, it will not be consumer beware, but the public be protected. And probably my greatest domestic achievement was the conservation of our natural resources. Don't you believe we should preserve our environment? I think you all do. It should be preserved for future generations. So as president, I, ex I saw to it, we created over 100 million acres of new national forests. We created new national parks. We expanded Yosemite Park. I made the Grand Canyon a national monument, and I created the first wildlife refuges. But there's this great story that really reveals my interest in conservation. I was on a camping trip in Mississippi and someone had found a bear cub, and they brought it over and they wanted me to shoot it. Well, what do you think I should do? Should I shoot the bear cub? No, that's exactly I did not. Well, when they found out I refused to shoot the bear cub, a toy manufacturer in New York found out about it. And you know what he honored me with? The teddy bear. And we are now emerging as a great power in the world, and it's not a question of whether we're going to play a role in the world or not. We are, but are we going to play it for good or for ill? For example, I found out we had a problem. If you wanted to sail from the east coast of the United States, say from New York City to San Francisco, you know how you had to sail? All the way around the tip of South America. Now, is there a shorter way? Does anyone have an idea for a shorter way that we can get through? Yes, sir. What's that? We could build a railroad. Well, we did build a transcontinental railroad, but what if we need to sail, sh ship things by water? Does anyone have another idea? Yes, sir. We could build a canal. Do you have any idea where we could build that canal? Panama, yes, the Isthmus of Panama. But there was a problem. Panama was controlled by Colombia, and I tried to talk to the Colombian government, but I had no more success talking to those jackrabbits than I could nail currant jelly to a wall. But you know what happened? The people of Panama decided to rebel against their Colombian masters. 
So I sent a warship down there to support the people of Panama in their revolution. We recognized the new Republic of Panama and we signed a treaty giving us a 10 mile wide strip of land across the Isthmus of Panama to build that canal. Oh yes, the Congress is debating about the treaty, but let them debate about the treaty because while they talk and debate about it, the building of the canal goes on. And do you also know that I was the first American president to receive the Nobel Peace Prize? Yes, I did it not for saying something, but for doing something. Yes. When war broke out between Russia and Japan, I brought both sides together in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and we negotiated a treaty between both of those nations to end that war. Yes, while I believe, while, the, while sometimes the glory, sometimes I've always said that sometimes the glories of, sometimes the glories of war are greater than the glories of peace, but I was proud to receive that Nobel Peace Prize. But I want to tell you, we had a bully time in the White House. Well, we had never seen such a young family in the White House, and we had a fun and bully time. And my children actually got the attention of a lot of the nation's press. You know, I have a daughter, Alice, and she's becoming a lovely young lady. But you know, one time they caught her smoking a cigarette in public. Another time she slid down the railing at the White House. And then another time I was having a cabinet meeting, and she interrupted it. You know what she had in her purse? She brought along some goddess snakes. <coughs> One of the cabinet secretaries said to me, Mr. President, can't you control your daughter Alice? I said I can control my daughter Alice or be president. I cannot possibly do both. <laughs> ah, but we had a bully time and we love to go out on outings. Does anyone here like to go out on an outing with me? Who would like to go out on a hike with me? Would you like to come, sir? Yes. Yeah, somebody else who hasn't done anything, come with anything. Sir, would you like to come out on a hike? And, I would, and would you like to come out on a hike? And how about, let's see, anyone else? How about right here at the end? Would you like to come out on a hike with me? Yes? Very good. And would you like to come out on a hike? Very good. Let's go out and take a nice hike. Very good. Now follow me. Let's go hiking around. You know, I always have a saying when we go on a hike, it's always over, over, under, or through, but never around. That means if we see a barrier, we don't go around it, we don't go, we go over it. Very good. Bully, bully. I remember one time I was out Oh yes, I would always take my morning rides and I'd startle people when I was riding through Rock Creek Park. Another time the ambassador from France was with me and I made him wade through the Rock Creek Park up, into our, up to our knees. But I have to tell you something else. Oh yes, why one time I didn't tell you. My, young, my son Archie was ill. So you know what my youngest son Kermit, you know what my youngest son, no, Quentin did? You know what he did to entertain his poor young brother who was bedridden? He snuck his pony into the White House elevator and brought it up into his, his brother's sick room. Oh, yes. And, you know, recently we've had a wedding in our family. Yes, you like to attend weddings? Well, let's get the wedding party ready. Okay, you two fellas right over here, sir. You right over here. Get behind him. Good, and you two right here. Yes, we had, yes, and I need you right over here. Yes, we recently had a wedding in my family. Uh, you may know of my niece, Eleanor Roosevelt. Well, she married a distant cousin of ours, Franklin, and I gave Eleanor away. And I understand, though, that Franklin is a very politically ambitious man. Yeah, well, you have to understand, they're from the Hyde, they're those, they're, those are the Hyde Park Roosevelts. They're the Democratic side of the family. We are the Oyster Bay Roosevelts. We're the Republican side of the family. And, well, Franklin's quite ambitious. You know, he'd like to be like his cousin Theodore, assistant, uh, a member of the New York legislature, which he already has been, the assistant secretary of the Navy, which I have already been, and I also understand he desires to eventually become governor of New York and, believe it or not, president of the United States. <laughs> We shall see, we shall see. You know, 
one time, the, the, my good friend, the British ambassador, Cecil Spring Rice, once said about me, you have to understand that the president is about six years old. Henry Adams says I was pure act, and a relative of mine once said about me, you have to understand about Theodore. When he goes to the wedding, he has to be the bride, but when he goes to the funeral, he has to be the corpse. Well, thank you all very much for enjoying the White House. Oh, yes. My children used to s roller skate through the White House. Well, in 1909, I decided to retire as president, and I asked my good friend, the Secretary of War, William Howard Taft, to run in my place, and he was nominated and elected. And then I decided to go on a safari to Africa. Have any of you ever been on a safari? I was, yes. Isn't it wonderful? We went out to Africa, where we went around hunting animals, and I shot and killed a lion as well as an elephant. And you know what? If you go to the Museum of Natural History in New York today, you can see them mounted on display. And that was my, that was my contribution for, for, for the conservation effort. But when I read... Oh, yes, you don't understand. Hunters are actually great conservationists. We realize we have to preserve the environment as well as control the animal population. But when I returned, I was very unhappy with President Taft because I thought he would vigorously carry out the policies that I had started as president. So I challenged him for the nomination. I actually won some of the, some of the new presidential primaries we had that year. But the party bosses thwarted and stopped the, what the people wanted to do and instead nominated President Taft. So I left the Republican Party and started my own political party, the Progressive Party. I said, I'm stripped to the bluff. I stand in Armageddon and I'm ready to stand and ready to battle for the Lord. I told the people I feel as fit as a bull moose and I went out and ran the most vigorous and strongest independent candidacy for president in our nation's history. But one day in October of 1912, just a few weeks before the election, I was in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and I was going to get in my car, and a man stepped out from the crowd and shot at me. Well, what happened was, he happened to hit my, steel gl my, my glass case made out of steel and my speech book. It wounded me, but it slowed down the bullet. But I was still strong enough that I still went on to speak for another hour. And then they took me to a hospital. Well, because of my glass case in the book, it slowed down the bullet, and it came within a quarter inch of my heart. But I survived. After all, it takes a lot to kill a bull moose. Well, I did not win that election. Woodrow Wilson won it instead. But I still wanted to go out and do things in life. I wanted to go out down to Brazil, down to the Amazon River, to explore a new unexplored river. Is there anyone in there who would like to come with me on this journey? Very good. Anyone has not helped? Yes, how would you like to come down with me? Would you like to come down, sir? Please. Anyone else who has not done anything today? I don't think you have, have you? No. Why don't you come down? Anyone else who has not done anything yet? How about you, young lady? Good. Very good. All right. Very good. Now we're going to go down. You ready to go down? We're going down to the Amazon, but we're going to explore a new tributary of the Amazon. It's called the River of Doubt. You see, it had never been explored before. So you, are, you, are you in your boats and you got your paddles out? Let's start paddling. You got to watch out for the... It's, it's very dangerous down here. And you know, we could also... Watch out, we might get infected by malaria because of the mosquitoes down here. And oh, I think you're going to have to help me get back. I'm, I became ill on that journey, and I, you're going to have to help me. I, I didn't think I was going to make it back, but we eventually did. I don't know how I made it. I lost a lot of weight on that trip and lost a lot of strength. But we explored that new river, and it was no longer called the River of Doubt, but it was now named after me the Roosevelt River. You know, I had lost a lot of strength and a lot of weight on that trip. And my relatives asked me, Theodore, why did you go? You know why I went? I told them, you see, it was my last chance to be a boy. I want to thank you for helping me out on that journey and helping me get back to civilization. Thank you.
When we entered the Great War in Europe in 1917, like 20 years earlier, I felt my place was to be at the front. I even offered to raise a, a, a division, a Roosevelt division, to help fight in that war. But President Wilson turned my requests down. Personally, I never felt he had the, personally, I felt he never had the, the, the backbone to be a man. Ah, but my four sons served at the front and proudly served at the front. But one day, in, the, in July of 1918, I received a telegram. My youngest son, Quentin, who was a flyer, was shot down and killed in action. It seems as if a lot of the fight had gone out of this old lion. But now, here I am, in the twilight of my life. And you know, just the other day, I was talking to my wife, Edith, and I said to her, you don't know how much I love Sagmore Hill. And when death takes me, it will have to take me when I am asleep, because if I am awake, there definitely will be a struggle. Nobody enjoyed being president as much as I did. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Mr. President. Delighted. Now, if, uh, if any of you have any questions, you raise your hand and stand up, and I'm going to give you the microphone, and then you state your name, okay? Who has the first question? Now, I know you girls are raising your hands a lot. Do you have a question? Well, th you think about it for a minute. Anybody? You do? Okay, come on up here. There you go. State your name. Then. My name is Brayden, and... How did you make the house? How did I pick my house? Very good question. It was built up on a nice hill, and I thought, what a lovely house. Actually, you were originally going to call it Lee Home after my first wife, but she passed away. But we decided to name it after an old Indian chief, Sagmore. That's how we picked the name for the house. Okay, right here. Um, my name is Nolan, and... Um, Theodore, when, when were you born? Where was I born? When was I born? Does anyone remember when I was born? Yes, sir. October 27th, and you remember the year? Not, not 1858, my goodness. It's, for me, it's still 1919. I, my goodness, I don't plan, I, I would love to live to be 100. Uh, my name is Charlie, and... Um, you remember you said you were a Republican? Weren't yes. you a Democrat originally? No, I, my family has always been Republicans. You're thinking of uh, my cousin Franklin and his family. Any parents? I have a question. Okay, where? Let's see. Uh, we have a question. You oh. did? Okay. Young fellow right here. My name is Matthew, and I was wondering how old you are. How old I am? Well, it's now January 1919. Why, that would make me 60 years old. Hi, my name is Adam, and how did you get into politics? How did I get into politics? Actually, my father was a fine example to me. He was always interested in, in we call noblesse oblige, that we of the upper class have an obligation to help those of lower classes. He was very charitable in helping soldiers during the Civil War and in helping poor people in New York City. And that inspired me to get involved, to use government not for my own purposes, but to help you, the public. That is what has always motivated me. Yes, young lady. Um, my name is Haley Johnson. Um, I have a question and a comment. Yes. Um, what, I was reading a book about you and I saw the word cow puncher. What is that? A cow puncher. Well, when we were working on the ranch and we were taking care, very similar to what a cat, we, somebody who works on a ranch and handles cattle. That's what we did. I had lots of head of cattle and we had to take care of them and get them to market. And um, I had a report on Eleanor Roosevelt and I made a puppet on her 
it, but I forgot it at home. Oh, well, I hope it's a very good one, and I hope you it becomes very. I hope you get a good grade on it. Actually, if there aren't actually, I have a question for you, young people. Uh, of course, I'm living in the year 1919, and I understand you're living in a different time. Who is your president today? Yes, young lady. President Obama. Obama? Sounds to me like, is he an Irishman? <laughs> wh wh what state is he from? Does anyone know which state he is from? Yes. Hawaii. Oh, yes, the territory of Hawaii. My goodness, a president from Hawaii. Next thing you'll tell me, we'll have a Puerto Rican on the Supreme Court and the governor of the Alaska Territory, a woman of all people, will probably run for vice president. We'll work it out. But go over there and a few people up on the other He's side. He's from Hawaii, but, but that's still a territory. Where was he elected from? From which state? Do you remember? Form a line over there. Yeah. Well, Obama it says an Irishman. Very interesting. He is Irish, isn't he? He's what, sir? African-American? A colored man as president? <clears throat> My, I remember when I invited Booker T. Washington to the White House, a great Negro educator and great leader of his people, and there was so much controversy that I invaded, invited a colored man to eat lunch with the president. People were shocked and outraged. We have certainly come a long way, and I'm glad to see that we have come a long way since then. Why, who, why, even in my time, they've already, I, I even appointed the first Jew to the cabinet, Oscar Strauss, and President Wilson has nominated Louis Brandeis to the Supreme Court. Why, who knows, maybe one day we'll even see a Catholic elected president. Mr. President, we yes, have one, one last question over here. Yes. Did you have one? My name is Whitney. Um, Whitney. Yes, Whitney. Um, when did, what year was, you, when your son died? What year did my son die? It was in July of 1918 that my son, Quentin, was killed in action. Oh. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, what we're going to do now is thank the president for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you.